Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You have tuned into the Rebel News live stream on this, a Tuesday, September 13th, 2022. I'm David Menzies and my co-host, well, let me tell you a little bit about my co-host. Folks, do you know that today is National Ants on a Log Day? That's actually a treat in which the ants are represented by raisins, but not if you're Claude Schwab, and my my co-host hates that. She is the she-devil with a sword. She is the Khaleesi of Northern Alberta. She is Sheila Gunn-Reed. How you doing there, Sheila? David, I'm doing great, and you do have that right. I will not eat raisins because they are representative of insects, and I don't even want to go down that road. Um, but it is also... I looked it up before I came on air. <laughs> it is also National Peanut Day. I yep. could take or leave peanuts. I just, I, I don't know. Um, it's also National Defy Superstition Day. Oh, really? Yes. Um, it's also European Heritage Days. And I think that might be racist to celebrate your <laughs> European Heritage these days. So I'm just, it's also International Chocolate Day. Uh, National Bald is Beautiful Day, <laughs> and also National Hug Your Boss Day. Oh, really? Well, you know what? Uh, we don't still don't have a human resources director here at uh, Rebel <laughs> News, so if you want to go ahead and uh, give Ezra a hug, uh, it's all completely a-okay, I think. <laughs> I don't think he's going to turn one down. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it's funny. You mentioned it was National Peanut Day, and... You know, it always, I don't know why it is that peanut allergies are so prevalent because I remember when I was going to elementary school, Sheila, and it's such a great, cheap, and nutritious lunch to have a peanut butter sandwich or peanut butter and jelly sandwich, um, lots of protein. And you never that's heard a any. Myth. That's a myth. Oh, is that right? There's not as much, as much protein in peanuts as you would have. Like as Mr. Peanut, the guy with glasses and the cane, <laughs> that he would have you believe. But the thing is, if you bring a bag of peanuts or a peanut butter sandwich to a school these days... Oh, you're going straight to jail. Oh, yeah. You may as well have <laughs> like, tossed a hand grenade into the gymnasium. Yeah. I mean, it, but how did this come to be, Sheila, that in our generation, this was perfectly normal, and today it is... Um, it's and I'm just wondering, is it I, I know I know there are true anaphylactic deadly allergies to certain food stuff. So I'm not, you know, dismissing that. Yep. But I wonder, is are those people claiming they're allergic to certain things, is it really an intolerance or they just don't like certain things? It's not something that is really gonna make them physically sick or even kill them. Because I don't know how in the space of just a couple of decades uh, a food staple in schools uh, became, like you said, you bring that on premises, they're calling the cops, right? I don't get it, Sheila. I think a lot of the time we are using the term food intolerance and food allergy interchangeably, and we shouldn't be, because I think those are two different things. Um, I also think a lot of this has to do with the constant sterilization of our babies, yep. as opposed to just letting them do baby things and Maybe they might chew on the end of a shoe sometimes when you're not looking and and get some of those, you know, antibodies into them, start creating antibodies anyways. Um, but also, I'm once again, I remain skeptical of the food industry and that inversion of the food pyramid. Um, once the government started telling us how to eat, when to eat, and what companies we should be buying our food from, all of a sudden, we get all these diseases that we never had before. Uh, high cholesterol, uh, heart disease. We've seen a prevalence in certain cancers that we never saw before. And all of a sudden, a bunch of allergies in young people. And I just think maybe we should just go back to how we were eating for millennia before uh, big food started getting in between us and the food on the shelf. You know what? I think you're really on to something with the idea of our babies and young uh, children being over sanitized 
uh, to the extent that they can't develop, you know, natural immunities to bacteria. Sheila, did we not learn anything from the great 1953 George Powell movie, War of the Worlds, where the Martians come down and they kick Earth's ass, they are decimating the planet, and then at the very end, um, they start dying because they have no resistance to our bacteria. So, yeah. again, I urge our viewers, watch War of the Worlds, and try to raise your babies differently. <laughs> yeah, well, and we've just decided very recently yeah. that natural immunity isn't a thing that exists <laughs> and a thing that we should rely on. Yeah, so I think this is only just going to get worse. Anyways, we've gone off on so many tangerines here, Sheila. What is the ostensible <laughs> policy reason of the hour or at least the 53 minutes uh, that lay ahead? <laughs> oh, goodness. I think my Skype feed is freezing up, but hopefully it'll uh, maintain enough strength to get us through the show. Um, this is the Rebel News daily live stream wherein we talk about the news or food allergies or... <laughs> the war of the worlds uh sometimes but that's the thing it's unscripted and so you never know what you're going to get uh particularly with david um and we are streaming on youtube but if you'd like to support the work that we do and interact with us might i suggest you move on over to rumble and odyssey there are thriving communities of rebel news viewers over there that i'm sure you'll like but you can also support the work that we do completely willingly by leaving us a paid chat on rumble it's called a rumble rant on Odyssey, it's called a hyper chat, and we'll do our best to read those live on air. So this is your chance to take over the show, really. You could really get David going in one direction here with a, a sizable rumble rant and a lame reference to pop culture, and he'll be giving her for like 20 minutes straight. We love it all, don't we, Sheila? Well, <laughs> I got to tell you, uh, just before I w hopped on the show for the first time, I did a uh, a live live stream with uh, Natasha Biazzi. Yes, I'm sorry, Sheila. I was a little um, promiscuous today. And uh, we were talking about this particular video. It's uh, Justin Trudeau. The, uh, the quote is, our job as a government is to build an economy where everyone is ready to thrive in a net zero world, end quote. I don't believe I'm reading this. And as I said to Natasha, when he says net zero, does that mean what's in your wallet once the Trudeau liberals yeah. get done? I see that and I'm like net zero jobs, <laughs> net zero. Literally, when he says net zero economy, I see like a big fat zero. Yeah, <laughs> where the economy should be. Maybe um, net zero uh, br uh, brain cells. But let's run the video yeah. in case you don't believe me, uh, because if you think uh, Justin Trudeau is an economic savior, just go out to Sheila Gunn Reed's territory where Trudeau liberal policies have devastated Alberta. What a bloody hypocrite. Let's roll that. Our job as a government is to build an economy where everyone is ready to thrive in a net zero world, an economy where everyone have real opportunities for meaningful work, an economy where people can count on their neighbors, on their communities, and yes, on their governments to have their backs through difficult times in the present and into the future. To do this, we all need to work together. Wow, Sheila, I, you know, our audience might not know that Justin Trudeau is actually a graduate from the Harvard Business School. That's where he came up with the phrase, the budget will balance itself. Right. I, I'm sorry, you say a slice of insanity like that as the aspiring prime minister, uh, you have lost all your street cred on economics. He says the government has our back, Sheila. I think he meant to say the government continues to stab Canadians in the no, back. No, I was going to say he's got a gun in my back. <laughs> <laughs> what did you make of that nonsense? You know, this we, we're going to have to rely on each other. Yeah, the food bank. Like, <laughs> like this guy, he at least he's moved on from the budget will balance itself to you might actually have to do something as a government. But let us never forget that this was the absolute economic moron who said uh, we will grow the economy from the heart to outward. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, he's such a deeply unserious man. And while he's saying this, 
that we're going to have, everybody's going to thrive in net zero. You know who's going to thrive during net zero? The guy selling winter coats because you're not going to be able to turn on your thermostat. But um, he also said that Pierre Polyev's financial ideas are dangerous for Canadians. What are those? Quit government spending? Like, or not even quit spending, but quit spending so damn much? Well, Justin Trudeau thinks that's dangerous. When Pierre Polyev says we got to get in from inflation under control because these young people are never going to be able to buy a house, Justin Trudeau says that's dangerous. And then he says, oh, like if I were to pick the dangerous idea, net zero is the dangerous idea. Yeah. And, you know, Sheila, when he uses the word everyone, well, not everyone. No, because not him. <laughs> yeah, you, and, and you're the expert on this file with the devastation in our energy sector. I mean, the province of Alberta likely has trillions of dollars of value trapped under the ground, which can't get shipped to market. Pipeline projects have been canceled. So, you know, out west, it's not a matter of share the wealth because he knows the Trudeau Liberals don't capture those seats. They might get one or two. So um, they are abandoned. They are the forgotten. They are the great unwashed masses. It's the Laurentian elites he uh, speaks of when he uh, talks of everyone. So it's it's absolutely a hi hypocrite. And, and, you know, I really think that Pierre Polyev, Sheila, is Justin Trudeau's worst nightmare. I, whenever oh, yeah. the election is, be it the fall or be it in 2025 or somewhere in between, I can hardly wait to see the first leaders debate We'll probably have to go to federal court, mind you, to get in again for the third time. But in any event, especially if the debate topic is on the economy, because Sheila, Pierre Polyev will make mincemeat of this trust fund baby. Um, I was just li going back through the transcript of what Justin Trudeau said here. And one of the things that I noticed that he said was about, uh, I think it's something about gratifying or fulfilling jobs, net zero, like having a gratifying or fulfilling job. As though working for a hundred plus thousand dollars a year in the oil patch leaves you feeling empty and depleted inside your soul. Like it's just ridiculous that this guy who would say, um, you know, this trust fund, not even silver spoon, but silver shovel in his mouth, baby, yeah. um, would say that these blue collar jobs that people are doing in oil and gas, in mining, uh, that those are not fulfilling or gratifying jobs. You know what a gratifying job is? When you can pay your bills and provide provide for your family. And right now, those net zero jobs, those nipple greasers on the wind turbine farms of the future, those jobs don't exist. Yeah. And he doesn't have empathy for the working man and the working woman, no. uh, Sheila, because what, what has been his resume? Uh, Part-time drama teacher, uh, was, was a full-time teacher in Vancouver, and then left under a very dark cloud uh, in which he had to resign mid-semester and had a lawyer come in. Gee, I wonder what that was about. That's a very weird way for a teacher uh, to part ways with their uh, school. But um, just a hypocrite. Oh, and speaking of hypocrites, we have coming up another hypocrite. That would be Bill Gates. But before we run that video, Sheila, we must take a break for a commercial advertisement. Are you liking the banter on our live stream that you're watching right now? If so, you should know that you can get exclusive Rebel News content by going to rebelnewsplus.com. You'll get special shows from my colleague Sheila Gunn-Reed, Ezra Levant, as well as the Menzoid Menzies, and you'll also get to view our exclusive documentaries, including the one that tells you the truth of what was actually discovered, at least what is known to be discovered so far at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. Take a look at the trailer. Well, the remains of 215 children have been found in a mass grave in Canada. Many of you know that just over a year ago, the discovery of the remains of 215 children was found at the Kamloops Indian Residential School at the Kamloops Shiswemek First Nation. But what if I were to show you that what I just said 
wasn't true. And that in fact, a year later, not a single body has been found. This mass grave is a painful reminder of the genocide. Canada's leaders aren't condemning the burning of churches. No, they're endorsing the burning of churches. A juvenile rib bone that surfaced in the same area. You'd be surprised the number of people who say, you know, I'm a doctor, I'm a paramedic. This is definitely a human bone, and it's hmm. definitely not. Is it the chief? Yes. You know, Sheila, they, that documentary coming out, Kamloops, The Buried Truth, this is why you need to be a Rebel News subscriber. If I wasn't working at the company, I'd certainly be a fan of the company. Drea is going out there. She is asking the impolite questions about a subject matter that the mainstream media considers to be the third rail. They dare not step on it. They dare not, you know, look behind the surface at some of the things uh, Drea uncovered. This is going to be a real blockbuster, Sheila. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's interesting, this reflex to think the absolute worst about your fellow Canadians, too, by the way. I think a lot of that is fueled by that. Um, so the media was quick to run with what little information they had. And as it turns out, much of it was misinformation. And I think it stems from this hate of your fellow Canadians, your fellow Canadians who just happen to be Christian, that they must be guilty of these things by virtue of being Christian. Exactly. Well, I uh, teased before the ad break, uh, we have something on Bill Gates. Um, I guess he went to some car, some sort of a a climate or innovation conference and it's of the course, cascadia innovation corridor conference it's a climate change thingy where when they talk about innovation they don't mean um fossil fuels oil and gas uh new technology there they mean expensive unreliable green technology that doesn't work and you can't afford a hundred percent and but at least bill gates led by example he rode his bicycle to the conference oh no he yeah. didn't he took another vehicle check it out folks <laughs> Uh, I don't know what that guy is yelling there on the uh, <laughs> megaphone. I, I We're just showing the video uh, because our Katie Davis court was there. I, it's not an endorsement for whatever he's yelling at there. But I remember saying in the morning meeting, and David, if you were paying attention, when Katie said, oh, I'm going to see if I can track down Bill Gates today, I said, he's coming in on a private helicopter and he is leaving in an SUV he absolutely is. They don't even care about their hypocrisy at these climate change conferences. And lo and behold, what did she find? Bill Gates in a helicopter and then getting into an SUV. Every well, time. Sheila reed in addition to being the Khaleesi, you are also the Cassandra because you are bang on with your uh, guess of what he'd be uh, departing in. And it's kind of funny. I mean, you know, it's one thing for the helicopter, but you notice, and that looks to me to be, uh, uh, GMC Yukon. Uh, yep. So when you say SUV, we're not talking about a little SUV or a mid-size SUV or a crossover. We're talking about GM's full-size SUVs. You know, it, our our liberal government is infatuated with them. Uh, almost yep. the entire fleet is Chevy Suburbans uh, and uh, Ford Expeditions. That's the step yep. up from the Explorer. And I don't think there's, I think there's seven or eight seaters. I don't think there's that many people in there. So again, it is uh, one law for thee, one law for me. It is not leading by example. And what I really despise about Bill Gates and his infatuation with WEF policies, World Economic Forum, Sheila, is that he's all about uh, tearing down the society we have, building back better, the Great Reset. And yet, look what Bill Gates did going back to the 70s. And I don't begrudge him this. He used capitalism to start Microsoft literally out of a garage and become one of the wealthiest men. And think, in fact, I think at one point for several years, the wealthiest man on the planet by using good old free market capitalism. 
And he wants to, now that he's set for life, several lifetimes, he wants to take that away. He doesn't want any other entrepreneurs to tap into the American dream and go from rags to riches. That is what I really despise about this preachy Silicon Valley oligarch, Sheila. Yeah, what's the moral of the story here? I think it's probably the most um, basic thing that your parents tell you, and that's don't forget where you came from. Yeah. And Bill Gates forgot where he came from pretty fast. I mean, think about this. He's one of those, like, go vegan, eat the bugs to save the planet people. But let me tell you, I bet the first time that that guy had two 20s to rub together in his hands once things started happening at Microsoft, I bet he got himself a nice steak. I bet. Mm. But that opportunity he had for himself, he doesn't want other people to have. Other people who are just sort of scraping their way into the middle class, he doesn't want them to enjoy the same fruits of their labor that he did. Wow. Well, when it comes to uh, continued hypocrisy and uh, WEF uh, philosophy, Sheila, this, hopefully this is a misprint. I can't believe my eyes because talk about a court challenge just waiting to happen. A Dutch city becomes the world's first municipality to ban meat advertisements in public. What? Sheila, meat, even in the Netherlands, it's a legal product. Uh, it's You can make the argument very well that it's actually good for you and nutritious. I'd certainly rather be a meat eater or omnivorous than a vegetarian or a vegan, God forbid. And yet, uh, of course, uh, the uncanny thing is this is the same neck of the woods where the government has declared war on the farmers regarding uh, fertilizer. What is going on here, Sheila? You live in farm country. This, this is appalling. This is the dumbest, most unscientific thing that I've ever read in my entire life. Besides the fact that meat is not bad for you, it's good for you. Um, the further we get away from our original diets, the worse we feel and the worse we look, actually. You see this like depleted jawline that a lot of people have? That comes from not chewing meat. Oh, but I anyway, didn't know that. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, there, there's something to be said <laughs> for um, it, it maintains the health of your bone in your jaw the, oh. the more you chew on things. Um, but of course, naturally, this is from The Guardian. So uh, <laughs> the things they say in here are crazy. So this is um, probably going to, I haven't read the story uh, in, in its entirety, Sheila, but uh, I imagine this is glowing praise uh, that they're heaping on this Dutch city, given that it is coming from the leftist yeah. guardian in the UK. Yeah, and they're talking about how, you know, like animal agriculture is bad because you have to cut down a forest to a, apparently i mean i guess you just don't graze cows on grassland like we do out here in alberta but apparently you cut down a forest and forests absorb carbon dioxide but somehow they don't understand that grasslands also sequester carbon if you care about those sorts of things um and they're worried about naturally nitrogen and methane from the cows um but these people never ever think okay yeah but you have to also cut down forests and mulch up all the little animals that live there so you can grow your avocados and your kale and stuff like that. Like Any agriculture changes the landscape. Frankly, cows are the least uh, dangerous to the landscape because the herds of cows we eat today, they're only replacing the large ruminants of eras gone by, the millions of buffalo that roam the prairie and other such ruminants. We just... Yeah have domestic cows doing it now, but we had buffalo doing it back then and other ruminants and other ruminants and other ruminants. This idea that this vegetarian lifestyle doesn't harm the environment. No, you got to plant that stuff somewhere and you have to knock down some trees and mulch up some little critters to do it. Excellent point, Sheila. Uh, bang on. And in terms of the other issue, the advertising factor, I'm very much... Uh, a free market kind of guy when it yeah. comes to advertising stuff. In other words, if it's a legal product, and yes, I'm including cigarettes, and I'm yeah, never I had don't a mind that either. Pardon me. Yep, yeah. I don't mind that either. I'm actually quite annoyed when they put it behind the the counter and you can't even see what the oh, smokes I know. are. I kind of like. 
I, it just annoys me. And I have never smoked a cigarette in my life. Yeah. Uh, and uh, same with me, uh, even cannabis. Uh, and I've never had any of the wacky tobacco uh, in my life either. But if it is a legal product, um, therefore, advertise it. You know what the hypocrisy here, Sheila, in this province, because I've looked into this, we have something called the Smoke-Free Ontario Act. And the Smoke-Free Ontario Act, the ostensible policy reason is to make sure youth aren't attracted to cigarettes. And if you're a retailer and they do secret sting operations where they get someone who's like 16 but looks like 20 uh, to buy something, that retailer faces uh, multi-thousand dollar fines, the loss of his liquor license, and if you run a variety store, that could put you out of business, That's actually. It. And yet, you go to any, um, or I shouldn't say any, but several uh, native reserves in Ontario, such as the Six Nations Reserve near Brantford, and it is the Las Vegas strip of smoking. There are uh, shops where it's advertising, where you can smoke the cigarettes in the shop. There are free giveaways. Uh, they don't check ID, and we, we've got all this on camera. The point is, Sheila, is that it is totally contrary to the spirit of the Smoke-Free Ontario Act, which is to have all these restrictions to keep children away from using tobacco, yet the government dare not put a foot on a native reserve to enforce the law. A complete double standard, and it's so cowardly. The province says, oh, it's a federal issue. The feds say it's a provincial issue, and you do that, you know, uh, merry-go-round, uh, uh, you know, you know, tossing off the uh, the responsibility to each entity. But again, I say if the product is legal, then advertise it. And I, I have confidence in people that just because they see a magazine ad or hear something on the radio or watch something on TV or see something online, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to stampede out and buy the product. Well, and I'm pretty sure the Netherlands, with their heavy, heavy, heavy bureaucracy there, yeah. I'm pretty sure they have a competition bureau or competition bureau adjacent uh, agency there that deals with false advertising. So advertise it, truth in advertising, and let it, if it's legal, like you say, let them advertise. Going back to your point about the cannabis stores, though, in Alberta, and the NDP did this, when they legalized cannabis here, what they did was they said you have to have these like opaque windows. Yes. So nobody can see in. Yes. And, you know, you can't sort of advertise, you know, the prices and stuff. But these opaque windows, they're a real problem because they are. It's the opposite in a liquor store. They say you can't obscure your windows with too many signages and too many ads for Bud Light or whatever. You can't do that because you need to be able to see in for safety and see back out for safety. But they've done the flip side in the cannabis stores and they keep getting robbed all over the place. And nobody even knows it's happening because you can't see in. Sheila, that is despicable. The same rule applies here in Ontario. Uh, it has to be an opaque window, or if you don't have that, it has to be papered up. Imagine a woman by herself who's the clerk at that cannabis store at nighttime, and somebody wearing trouble on his shirt comes in. Um, if that was a clear view, you could have a, a passerby call yeah. law enforcement or intervene, but you don't know what's going on in there. This is a dangerous situation. So the cannabis store has to be... Um, you know, disguised, cloaked, whatever the word is. Yet right next door, the government-controlled LCBO store, um, clear glass, you can see in, you can see the stock, you can see the people. But what's the difference? They are both age-restricted products. It makes no sense. And that rule has to go. And Sheila, it again... Did. It just did. The, Very recently, it just did, uh, I think, uh, two weeks ago. They finally changed it. Oh, in after, Alberta? Uh, in Alberta. Okay, not they just here. just changed it. Yeah, they just changed it. Uh, there, uh, I think it was August 11th when they just changed it here in Alberta. But that was like after four years of nonstop robberies. Unbelievable. You know, and that was shameful. And the only reason for it was the same reason you have 
you know, convenience stores and gas stations put the cigarettes behind that, you know, secret wall. You know, they don't want children to see the product. But if you have an age restriction at the door, you have to be 18, yeah. 19, whatever. It's a moot point. You know, it, it, it makes no sense and, and it's dangerous. And I hope Ontario follows suit because that's good news that happened in your province, Sheila. Yeah, it just happened. Now, it's interesting that you can like put a pot leaf on anything, right? Like pot leaf Canada Day flags, pot leaf t shirts. But if kids see a cigarette package with those scary teeth <laughs> <laughs> on a shelf, that's going to make them want to smoke. But the pot leaf all over everything, that won't. That's fine. That's just marketing. Uh, uh, unbelievable. And you mark my words with this ban on uh, advertising meat in this Dutch town and what we see in Canada with hiding. Um, cigarettes behind, you know, that wall. You are going to see in our lifetime, Sheila, with the nutrition uh, zealots, they're going to demand that gas stations, convenience stores also put behind the wall candy bars, potato chips, because those are incentives for kids to want something that is uh, allegedly unhealthy for them. Uh, not considering that you can have a candy bar or a bag of chips in moderation. It's not going to do anything to your health, but that'll be the next frontier. You mark my words. Now, before we get hey, into- just wait, just wait. I just <laughs> want to go back to like my point about the weak jawline that you see in oh, yes. um, modern men. Um, <laughs> Science, <laughs> Science Daily, I dug it up. I knew I had read it somewhere. The University of Kent said the jaw size is indeed linked to diet. If you look back at our- human ancestors they had a much stronger jaw um and it is from too soft of a diet which causes the lower jaw to stay too short and it causes orthodontic problems and uh, new research suggests that many of the common orthodontic problems now this includes like crooked teeth experienced in people in industrialized nations and they can do, compare industrialized nations where we've extro we're too far away from our original diet to people in non-industrialized nations who have more of a traditional diet um they can they see the deterioration in the modern western world jaw wow. anyways it says people in industrialized nations due to their soft modern diet is causing the draw, jaw to grow too short and small in relative to the size of their teeth Wow. Well, Sheila, uh, you know, I take a size 13 wide uh, shoe. What does that study say about uh, men with big feet? Uh, gravity. Uh, it's pushing <laughs> you down, you weigh too much, and it's flattening out your feet. Okay. Got to loosen I'm sorry my sorry I asked. Anyway, <laughs> before we get into more, folks, we got to take another ad break. Check it out. Hey folks, check out the newest arrival to the Rebel News Store. Yes, F is for Fidel and F is for father. I mean, could it be? Yes, it, half this photo, the colored half, is Justin Trudeau. The black and white half is a young Fidel Castro. Wait now, or is it vice versa? It's so confusing. I'm a huge Forensic Files fan. Wouldn't it be great if we could have piece of Justin's DNA and a piece of Fidel's DNA and put the rumor to bed once and for all. But in the meantime, we'll just have to walk around wearing this shirt, hinting at a great Canadian conspiracy. Or is it? In any event, if you want to get this shirt, folks, go to the Rebel News Store and check this out. Type in our new discount code, that's SUMMER, S-U-M-M-E-R, and if you buy two unisex t-shirts, you get an additional one for free. What a deal. Like I said, Justin Trudeau, Fidel Castro, as they used to say on the ABC detergent ads, can you tell the difference? I can't tell the difference. You know, Sheila, I that is our... Sorry, David, I burst out every time that X-Files music comes on. <laughs> I, know, I, I just almost spit my coffee out. You know, I, I love it, Sheila. And uh, folks, that is indeed our number one uh, yep. merch seller. Um, and here's a question for you, Sheila. Um, if Justin Trudeau, and I'm sure he must have at least at some demonstration spotted uh, one of our viewers uh, decked out in that T-shirt... What do you think is going through his mind? I, I wish I had that kind of personal conduit 
to say to him, Mr. Trudeau, when you see that T-shirt uh, implying that Fidel Castro <laughs> is your actual biological father, um, do you just shrug it off or does it make you upset? I bet it just burns him. Oh, I'm sure because <laughs> it's, a, it's a slight at his entire family. Um, his dad for breaking that embargo. Um, I don't want to say much about his mom. I think Esther got in trouble one time for for that. But anyway, um, I, I think Justin Trudeau thinks about seizing the bank accounts of people who wear that shirt. And, and I'll tell you, um, I've Lady Menzoid, uh, that's her favorite shirt. She's been wearing it all summer. <laughs> And I think I told you this, at a couple of places she went to, a home improvement place, a landscape place, the clerk that was serving her loved the shirt so much, <laughs> she gave her uh, Lady Menzoid an unasked for discount. <laughs> so here's something, Great. folks, you pay the 40 bucks or so, and it can actually make money for you. It can pay off uh, uh, for you. You know, it, it's funny, she got this really dirty look at a, um, uh, a big box store on the weekend, Sheila. She was wearing her Hillary uh, for prison uh, T-shirt. Yeah, I have that one too. <laughs> oh, and and the guy circled back, uh, you know, to look again, and then his the scowl on his face turned into a smile, and he said to uh, my wife, "I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to stare, but." I thought that shirt said Hillary for president. I know. I've and got it that too. Me off. Now that I know what it really says, I'm very happy. So, you know, don't I got be that too at the farm supply store where <laughs> I'm like down there buying binder twine and the guy's like looking at me, looking at me. And I'm thinking, okay, well, is this. I'm not used to having unfriendly people at the farm supply store recognize me. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's looking and then he goes, oh my gosh. It says prison. I'm like, yeah, it says prison. He's like, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, in your neck of the woods, uh, that is a popular sentiment. Keep in mind, this is in the GTA. And Sheila, I mean, hope abounds. If you're getting, you know, uh, bystanders and passersby, uh, you know, volunteering like, oh, I love that shirt instead of yeah. condemning you in, you know, an area that's part of the Laurentian elites. I think that bodes very well for whenever this next yeah. election is going to happen. So there you go. Now, bring it on. Uh, oh, what's that, Sheila? No, I just said bring it on. Bring oh, on the next election. Absolutely. <laughs> by, by the way, can <laughs> I, I ask wait. you this, Sheila? And I want to say you and Ezra did a magnificent job covering uh, the Conservative Party uh, uh, leadership uh, event on Saturday. And I just want to, um, you know, I guess it, it, it's getting uh, past the best before date. I mean, uh, yes, Pierre Polyev with more than two thirds of the, the votes on the first ballot won. But what was your takeaway? Uh, I was I was watching the live stream. Uh, I was elated, first of all. And uh, secondly, uh, it was actually quite shocking how poor, how poorly Jean Charest did. But I guess... You know, the um, the chickens are coming back to roost when he published that hideous open letter where he was diminishing freedom, putting freedom in scare quotes that there are, you know, there are more important things to fight for than freedom. More important. What would be more yeah. important? What's the opposite of freedom, Sheila? Tyranny, slavery. And then there you go. His open letter to my fellow members of the Conservative Party of Canada. By the way, I think that was the final nail in his own coffin, yeah. and it was self-inflicted. And then when he's doing his, you know, wrap-up speech, he thanks all the candidates that vied for the leader. That was nice and classy. But he included the disqualified lying liar weasel, sneaky Patrick Brown. Why are you thanking him, Mr. Charest? I know you two love each other. I mean, Patrick Brown, when he was a teenager, had a poster of you in his bedroom that creeps the hell out of me. I got to tell you, yeah. Sheila. But this guy should not be a conservative. Uh, do you see a trend here? It's not a rebel hate on for Patrick Brown, folks. The, uh, the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada... Uh, of Ontario, rather, got rid of this weasel in 2018. Um, the federal Conservative Party of Canada got rid of him this year. Does anyone notice a trend that this guy is toxic, that he's not a real conservative? So 
Jean Jure, what are you thanking him for? That he got caught in another scandal yet again? You know, I was just referring back to some Ipsos polling that was done for Global News about a week ago before this. And this is what they said. This is their analysis. This is quoting, I think it's Daryl Bricker who runs Ipsos. Quote, the race is a lot closer amongst conservative voters in those two major provinces. And as we know, every major election comes down to really those two provinces talking about Ontario and Quebec. Is that? But as it turns out, Pierre Polyev took every riding except two in Ontario and every riding except six in Quebec. Um, that was amazing. I'm, yeah. And I'm looking at the numbers breakdown though it is not reflected in the points value because of the weird way the Conservative Party awards the points. When you look at the bulk votes, uh, Leslie Lewis and Jean Charest are literally tied. They got the same amount of support from Conservative voters. So um, I think that was actually quite outstanding for Leslie Lewis, given that the entire universe, including the Liberals, uh, were all cheering for Jean Charest. Um, I, I think, though, I saw some polling, too. I think maybe it was Ipsos. So take that for what you will after I just bashed their inaccurate polling. But they say of the thousand and one people that they polled for this thing, a total of 42 percent of Canadians say they don't know enough about Pierre Polyev to form a perception. Now, that's, I think, good. Uh, that means there's a lot of slander for the mainstream media to start dishing out all over the place to get to those remaining 42 people, 42 percent of people. But I think it also means that we could see uh, an election sooner rather than later, because I don't think Justin Trudeau is going to want those people to get a favorable impression of Pierre Polyev. Um, and I think the more they get to know him, and especially his secret weapon wife, Anida, um, I think Justin Trudeau is going to pull the shoot sooner rather than later before people figure out who Pierre Polyev is. I think you could be right, Sheila. I know Ezra feels the same way. I'm 50-50, and I know that's a really wimpy fence-sitting position. But uh, for the reasons you just described, that is a strategy for uh, Trudeau to call another election. Or he might just cling on to power as long as he can. And here's the X factor. I heard rumblings of this, but I'm not sure this is credible. Uh, Jagmeet Singh might walk away from this, um, you know, gentleman's agreement they have because, you know, even uh, the elites and the media types are basically describing the NDP in certain circles, Sheila, as a non-credible party. When you have Jagmeet Singh denouncing Justin Trudeau on a daily basis, yet in the House of Commons, always, always, always propping up the government. What does that say? What is your relevance? You know, and the only th reason I can think of Jagmeet Singh, quite frankly, going all the way to 2025, that's the magic number for him. That's the six year mark in which he gets a fully uh, paid government pension, uh, win, lose or draw. So there's a lot of variables here. Uh, Personally, Sheila, I hope uh, Trudeau does uh, pull the trigger and go for a fall election. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Can't wait. Yeah, uh, I, I saw the other day, too. I think it was Thomas Mulcair. And the reason I bring up Thomas Mulcair is I think he was the last reasonably normal <laughs> yes. uh, leader of the NDP. He sort of kept the fringe radicals in the party under control, or at least he told them to shut up in the media. Uh, that it, that has completely unraveled under um, Jagmeet Singh, who I don't think has taken a salary as the party leader. So I see your point about hanging on to uh, hanging on long enough to get that pension because he is. I don't think the party fundraises enough for him to draw a salary as a leader. I I've seen. Some, I don't know if that's changed since, but I know that was a symptom of the party previously. But uh, just to show you where Jean Charest was on the political spectrum, you know who endorsed him for the leadership? 
Thomas Mulcair, the former leader <laughs> of the NTP. Oh, my goodness. That and Christy is... Clark, sorry, Christy Clark, the former liberal leader of BC. Who was yes. Liberal in BC is sort of a right wing coalition of conservatives and liberals, or at least free market liberals. Um, but she was a Harper critic and she was in the liberal wing of the BC Liberal Party. And she was like, I've joined the Conservative Party of Canada to endorse Jean Charest. And I know there are a lot of people who are like, I'm going to vote even harder for Pierre Polyev now to oh, keep yeah. Christy Clark, I... the pipeline blocker, out. Talk about the Barbara Streisand effect, eh, Sheila? But, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and I got to tell you, uh, Thomas Mulcair, I agree with you. I think he was the adult in the room at that party. Uh, the NDP, and I, I'm telling you, when they became the official opposition, I didn't think I would live long enough to ever, ever see that, Sheila. I, I know that was kind of a cosmic fluke when the orange wave happened. But I would like to ask NDP rank and file members, if you could do it all over again, do you have maybe buyer's remorse getting rid of Mulcair and putting in that dud Jugmeet Singh? I, you know, I, I know in terms of the diversity card, this is great virtue signaling for you. But like, where's the beef, as Clara Peller used to say? Well, in that Dutch city, you can't advertise the beef. So I guess. <laughs> Do you know, as a conservative, I cheer for a strong NDP. Oh, I agree. hundred uh, percent. You know, that Thomas Mulcair's grown-up normalcy in a party of mad people, um, even though I would fundamentally disagree with him on literally every, I literally yep. everything. I don't think he was a lunatic. I think he was a socialist. Um, although there's, you know, the circles overlap there a little bit. Um, but um, the strong showing of the NDP helped deliver Stephen Harper majorities all the time because it split the progressive vote. But then yep. Justin Trudeau decided, okay, well, I'm going to be more left wing than the NDP. Oh, yeah. Render the NDP irrelevant. All those votes moved over to him and he keeps forming majorities because of it. Or 100%. at least, some, you know, government at this point. Anyways, we should keep moving because we're running out of time. Yes. Rapidly. And on that note, uh, yeah, you're right. Um, uh, time like Bill Gates's uh, helicopter flies. Uh, we're just uh, 12 <laughs> minutes to the hour. So we're going to break. For an ad, uh, our last one, folks, and then I think we have to get to uh, some of your comments. Can't wait for Sheila to read those. Wait, so, wait let's though. Go for after we one... come back, wait. After we come back from the ad break, can we please, please, please talk about the Green Party? Their misgendering incident. Oh, <laughs> it's just like that. That mm. should have been the lead item. Of course, we'll talk oh. about that misgendering. Now that's serious. <laughs> Anyway, past time for you. Just check out what Adam <laughs> Seuss has to say, and uh, we'll get to the Green Party misgendering story. Adam Sos here for Rebel News. You know, our company is growing quickly, and we'd actually like for your company to grow too. That's why this ad space that I'm speaking through right now is actually available for you to purchase. So instead of people listening to me, they could actually be learning about your company, learning about your business. If this interests you, if this is an opportunity you'd like to capitalize on, send us an email at ads at rebelnews.com. Well, I asked, where's the beef? And there, you had your answer. He's <laughs> Adam's looking uh, pretty buff out there. I, 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 yeah. I that, he looks like the kind of guy in the prairies that eats a steak or two, despite what the World Economic Forum is telling him to eat. <laughs> yeah, Adam's putting away a side of beef like every two weeks. I'm sure of it. Um, okay, let's get to the story about the Green Party because the Green Party continues to be just an absolute sideshow, like a circus freak tent of bad uh policies and bad behavior and i'm just going to stand back and watch them eat themselves alive here it's like a snake <laughs> eating its tail or when your enemies are fighting you just better just lean up against the wall and let things happen um i saw that um th they're considering canceling their leadership race and liz may's back to take it over because it's just a cult of personality it's not wow. even a real party anymore um, but anyways, let's go to this. Misgendering incident plunges Green Party of Canada into renewed <laughs> turmoil. Imagine a party so fragile that if somebody used the wrong pronouns, the party now is just in a complete and total uproar. <laughs> but the, it is. In a Zoom appearance to kick off the party's leadership contest, David, you're just going to laugh your whole way through this. Uh, interim leader Amita Kutner was identified by she- L pronouns instead of they, them. 
<laughs> just one year after its partial meltdown, you see they've only mel they melted down partially last year. During the 2021 federal election, the Green part of, Party of Canada is once again in crisis over an incident of misgendering. I can't even with these people. It all started at a September 3rd media event in Vancouver, kicking off the party's leadership contest in a Zoom appearance Interim leader Amita Kutner was identified using a caption bearing the pronouns she L, which um, apparently killed her. She's dead now. Uh, <laughs> Kutner, 32, identifies as non binary and pansexual, attracted to all genders and orientations, and goes by they, them pronouns. In a subsequent statement, I can't believe she issued a statement over this. <laughs> Kutner slammed the misgendering, saying the incident made me feel hurt and isolated. <laughs> And hinted that it was reflective of a larger pattern of behaviors that a few in the party are pe perpetuating. The statement added, in moments like the, this is too much. These people are too fragile to be alive. <laughs> the statement added, in moments like these, I wonder, how can I ensure other people's safety <laughs> if I can't even ensure my own? Wait, wait a minute, Sheila. Let me let me just chime in. Um, was there a downed hydro wire or something? What what made this an unsafe event? <laughs> Using the wrong pronouns. Like, can you imagine if you spelled this person's name wrong? They'd have to be forcibly medicated. Holy moly! Anyways, uh, the liver or the uh, greens just continue to be um, crazy people. Um, imagine, look, whatever you think about people who are non-binary or whether you think that's real or exists. This is akin to somebody spelling your name wrong on yeah. a byline. Yeah. Settle down. This doesn't make you unsafe. It might be annoying because you, because you think you're more important than you are. Um, but it's an accident. It happens. Nobody's unsafe. There are people who are actually unsafe in the world. Using the wrong pronouns does not make you unsafe. It might make you feel disrespected because you put too much emphasis on what other people think about you. But it doesn't make you unsafe. It's not like it's somebody's going to come and like steal your wallet or kick you in the back because they didn't call you they them. This is ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. Well, Sheila, on that note, then, thank God the adult in the room, Elizabeth May, is returning because uh, not much crazy there. Oh, yeah, a whole lot of crazy. And folks, if you've never seen it, Google uh, her um, speech. I think it was from seven years ago, 2015. At the PPG. Yeah, and her um, uh, her outpouring of love for uh, Omar Khadr, our uh, homegrown Al Qaeda terrorist slash murderer, uh, and this is considered to be the elder stateswoman, or do I have to say statesperson? I don't want to misgender anyone. Wait. And by the way, I wonder if she'll drive to the conference uh, in her uh, energy efficient uh, plug-in hybrid uh, Toyota Prius. Oh, sorry, I meant her Dodge Viper with some 640. You know, I thought about that the other day when you did that video from the car show about net zero yeah. and you ran into that guy who's a Green Party supporter and you were sort of taken aback because you're like, why is a Green Party supporter here loving up the muscle cars? And I thought, no, they love them. Just ask Green, uh, Green Party leader Elizabeth May. <laughs> they forgot. love their muscle cars. <laughs> Um, but anyways, this story gets crazier because now oh, no. they want to cancel the leadership race <laughs> altogether because of this event. Because no. how can we have a leadership race when we need to have an investigation into this pattern of harassment and dangerous behavior by, I don't know, spelling mistakes? Like it's... It, it, it's obvious that it's not poorly intended because they put the pro they they put pronouns in the lower third. So obviously this is a green party thing, right? They just got the pronouns wrong, which is what can happen when you insist on putting your pronouns in everything. Sometimes people will get them wrong. But yeah, now they want to stop democracy altogether because somebody <laughs> thinks that it's dangerous because they accidentally got your pronouns wrong. And yet no concern in the Green Party about so many of their members, Sheila, that are, you know, they're anti-Semites. Uh, yeah. This party has a very dark recent history about welcoming people with that attitude into the party. That's okay. 
but you misgender someone, you don't use the proper pronouns, oh, well, uh, we got to go right back to the drawing board and refigure this party out. Oh, please, Justin, please call a fall election <laughs> just, just for this reason alone, just to catch these guys so off guard. I mean, they're like you said, Sheila, they're worried about pronouns and they don't have their focus on the bigger picture, you know, getting another MP or two elected. It This is staggering. And basically, it makes a mockery of their credibility, to be quite frank. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... I was just Googling how many of these people were involved in those like anti-Israel flotillas yep. a few years back. Remember those? It was like just they may as well have flown the Green Party flag on the, on the deck of that ship. It was like a Green Party booze cruise, yeah. pro-terrorism booze cruise. Anyway, let's get uh, to some of these uh, chats that we yes, can wrap please. up because I think they need the studio. Uh, Kane and Mark gives us two bucks, said, I had to laugh with the hands on hip guy from Global News from David's story about the um, knife attack, allegedly, that happened at Global News. We know there was a knife incident down there. And um, with all the chatter from Global News's TikTok celebrities about dangerous for journalism, they never did a story about violence that happened in their own workplace. And I sure think that's odd because David, if you turned up to work and tried to knife somebody in the workplace, <laughs> let me tell you, all the other media would be all over it like a dirty shirt. Oh, Sheila, the timing of this was truly incredible. Uh, about a week or so ago, 48 journal uh, media companies and organizations sent an open letter to Justin Trudeau denouncing attacks, that means mean tweets, by domestic extremist groups. That means um, basically Freedom Convoy people. And um, then just days later, what, someone we, ex we suspect is a current or former employee of Global went to Global News Toronto headquarters with a knife. Huge police response. Look at that, folks. Uh, and there were several more cruisers than that one that appeared. And um, a paramedic as well. And I understand it was a quite the frantic um, occurrence that happened. Well, now we have a cover up. First of all, no charges, which is really odd. I, I think brand. Look at all those cruisers there, Sheila. I think yeah. brandishing a knife in a workplace, especially on the heels of that horrific knifing attack in Saskatchewan. I think that's pretty serious. Uh, but no charges and no news coverage, not only by global folks, but by all their competitors in the media. And here is the reason I think this went down. I truly believe this was someone who was an employee because when we went there, uh, I'm speaking of Lincoln, Jay and I, you could not get into that building. It was locked down. And as you can see, uh, the security come out and uh, greet you before you can even get uh, to the door. So that suggests someone got in easy peasy with a key fob or a key or what have you. Now, if that attacker had not been a media person, someone that worked for Global News, say it was somebody that looked like me, Sheila, wearing a MAGA cap. Say it was a guy in a pickup truck with a Canadian <coughs> flag hanging from the bed that did this. This would be a 24-7 news item. It would be around the clock. Look at those domestic extremist groups and their violent uh, followers. But when it's one of their own, shh, nothing to see here. Unbelievable. And Sheila, somewhere in Ottawa, curled in the fetal position, Rachel Gilmore weeps. <laughs> She's, you know, she, uh, <laughs> oh, that woman, like what a deeply unserious individual. If that were my daughter, I would be like, get off TikTok, <laughs> put on a shirt oh, yeah. and do some real journalism. Where are her parents? No, but Sheila, she has to take her shirt off because she wants you to see that she got her. her... Band-Aid. Yeah. You know, imagine that. Imagine somebody, an adult who thinks it's an accomplishment to get jabbed by a needle, regardless of what, you know, the needle had in it, that you'll go on social media and go, look at me, look at me, isn't that great? Like, like you've invented. Because it's, because it's a symbol of unearned heroism yes, for these people. Exactly. They, that thing right there, 
makes them just like a firefighter rushing into a burning building. I am saving lives, carrying out grandmothers and climbing trees to save cats. That's how they think because they've never done actually anything good for anybody else in their life. So this is as close as it's ever going to get for them. But Sheila, who, and another thing, who puts their medical history on social media? That's supposed to be private. Again, psychopaths. (laughs) And again, people who think that undergoing a medical procedure gives them some sort of unearned virtue. It makes them a hero. It's like, you know, like putting like Afghanistan veteran in your bio. That's fine if you're an Afghanistan veteran. But for them, they think that they are akin to that because they're like triple boosted or whatever. You see people like put the like the three needle emojis um, beside their name in Twitter, um, which is one of the most ridiculous uh, things I've ever seen in my life. This is going to be the new satanic panic where we're going to look back and say, why were we so hysterical (laughs) about vaccines and our vaccination status? Why were we going around treating other people like that? when there was nothing wrong with them, they just chose differently than us. I think with the benefit of hindsight, a lot of people are gonna think, God, I was a total idiot. You know, it's funny you mentioned that about the needles and uh, social media. I saw this, um, I guess, thumbnail for somebody online. I think it's meant to be facetious. I think the person's being sarcastic, but you never know these days. But he had the multicolored rainbow flag he had um, the Ukrainian flag, oh, and he had all. three needles. <laughs> like, it's like everything but the kitchen sink. Oh, and- yeah. He's probably, like, <laughs> taking things that are relevant out of his bio. So he had space to add all his virtue signaling emojis. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Oh. These people. These Wiccans. Um, anyways, let's uh, keep going. We've got one from AMT60 gives us a buck. I'm looking forward to Parliament starting and Pierre verbally slamming Justin Trudeau for his policies. Well, you know, he did that last parliamentary sitting too. So if you need a fix, go back on YouTube, you'll find it. Now that he's the leader <laughs> of the Conservative Party of Canada, vax mandates, arrive cam, can, and monetary policies can be challenged. You know what? They are being challenged through the courts. Um, arrive can, vax mandates, Uh, Those are all being challenged by our friends at the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, but also by our friends and allies over at the Democracy Fund. And they're doing incredible work there. Um, They are, you know, filing court motions and filing lawsuits all the time. If you'd like to support the work that they do, uh, because they're really only uh, like a couple to three legal um, organizations in this country of nearly 40 million people doing this work, um, just go to... uh, the Democracy Fund website, and you can make a tax deductible charitable donation. So yep. you your money goes even that much further, um, and you get a little bit back on your taxes. So, um, anyways, win I, win. I suggest if you yeah, if you want to help fight back, uh, you want to get involved in the fight. One of the best ways to do that is to support some of the best lawyers in the country and the work that they do. Okie doke, Fraser McBurney. Cap blocks fully engaged are Hamilton, fight the fine recidivist and habitual <laughs> protester. And I say that all with love. Uh, gives us five bucks. Countdown, just four more days until the worldwide rally kicks off in most cities in support of our farmers. In Hamilton, meet us at Hamilton City Hall at 12 noon yesterday. You did not read my chats on Odyssey. I forgive you. Oh, I'm very sorry, uh, Fraser, if the team can find those for us and uh, put them in the chat, maybe the team can read them tomorrow um, because we, uh, Fraser is here every single day. Yeah, every Sheila, single day. I'm so sorry, Fraser, but I shall not be going to Hamilton City Hall to cover that protest because when I do, there's a bylaw officer. I can't remember her name, but I remember her pronoun, she, her, and she takes my photograph and then mails me a ticket for $360 for practicing journalism. And here's the best part, or actually the darkest part. It's something called an AMPS ticket, which means you cannot fight it in court. It is completely undemocratic. When Ezra first heard of this, he said, we're gonna challenge this. Guess what? It was challenged in front of the Supreme Court of Canada in 2016. And the Supreme said, yep, Nothing to see here. Having a ticket and getting convicted and fined without a trial uh, is A-OK. 
So um, uh, just a word of warning, uh, Hamilton bylaw loves that little uh, power. Uh, so watch out for, uh, and check your email box. They actually don't even deliver it by courier. They send it by email. It's astonishing. You know, uh, Spirit Whisperer 2021 gives 10 bucks uh, and says, oh, I know a little something about this. This is good. Uh, my sister lives in the Caribou territory where Christian Freeland is expanding the Caribou Park and is very worried about losing their land. Okay, let me help you with this. Maybe I can alleviate some of your fears. Now, do I think Chris Jeff Freeland is a sinister hobgoblin? Yes, I do. Um, <laughs> and there are plenty of reasons for that, including her seizing of innocent people's bank accounts and her glee in which she did it. So um, anyways, and also her propensity to not wear clothes that fit her. But anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, God, I'm the thinking caribou, that blue dot. <laughs> oh, poor Kian Baxter. Anyways. <laughs> In speaking about, I think you're talking about Caribou Mountains, Wildland Provincial Park. I'm not even sure. They, they use an Indigenous name, and I'm not sure what the Indigenous name is. But it, the park itself was created in 2019. It's a provincial park. So as much as I think Christa mm. Freeland would overstep her boundaries, and she has in the past when she sees bank accounts, but she cannot expand this provincial park. The provincial government can and did double the size of it caribou uh wildland provincial park and um they did that it's been, was doubled in size to over seven hundred thousand acres i think it's one of the um largest uh lakes or parks in the world it's six times larger than waterton lakes national park but christy freeland didn't do that jason kenny did now I also don't think caribou are endangered the wildland caribou that they keep trying to protect they're not any genetically different than any other caribou, which are some of the um, most populous ruminants on the face of the earth. They're just caribou that live in the wrong place, so they don't thrive very well. There's like a handful of them that are in Jasper National Park, and they like are failing to produce. And um, there's a handful of other ones like roaming around somewhere else. But they are not genetically distinct from regular old-fashioned caribou. But the NDP had this propensity to want to just build a park and protect them and what that meant for forestry was really bad but for the ndp who are anti-resource industry the caribou were the perfect thing to block forestry and oil and gas because they said all the seismic lines that they run for oil and gas that was disturbing the caribou and it's like who cares if they die there's like a gazillion more like three hours north who cares if these six die but they wanted to keep protecting them so I'm of two minds. I don't care about protecting the caribou. There's a lot of them. I don't care. They're delicious too, by the way. But um, moreover, to your point about Christia Freeland uh, expanding the caribou park, she cannot. If you're worried about the expansion of this park, you have to take it up with Jason Kenney's government because it's a provincial park. So in other words, Sheila, she made a caribou boo. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do get it. Um, <laughs> I just didn't laugh because I didn't think it was funny. Um, let's keep going. Uh, Lisa Proust, uh, 15 bucks. Dear Sheila and dear David, I miss you very much. Oh, Lisa. Oh, that's very uh, nice. I've been busy with work, but you're always in my thoughts. Love you both. I said both, Sheila. I know, but I know also that David <laughs> is your favorite. That's okay. I'm not for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. And uh, I assume you're still in uh, Montreal and uh, next time I'm there. Um, if I'm allowed to go there, <laughs> I, I got to check on that. Uh, uh, hope to see you. Thank you. Uh, by the way, Alexa is uh, in and around your parts of the world. Maybe you yes. could get together. Yeah. Okie doke. Let's go to the next one. I am black. I'm just reading the name. Uh, That's <laughs> not bucks. from Justin Trudeau, is it? <laughs> no, I didn't say I am blackface. <laughs> By the way, in your in your ad about Justin Trudeau, the Justin Castro shirt where you're talking about DNA tests, I think he, all you'd have to be is a pretty girl around Justin Trudeau and you could at least get a sample of his DNA and possibly a handprint. Wow. Which female rebel shall we dispatch for that caper, no, Sheila? None of them. None of them. I'm not just doing that to any of them. I don't even like sending them to like things where there might be nudity. <laughs> like, I'm just... <laughs> Anyways, I am black is this five bucks. I can't imagine that Trudeau would call for an election since Pierre Polyev just sent the last two to three campaigning for prime minister. And he clearly has momentum. 
Um, I think, I don't know. You know, I saw this article yesterday that there are some now within the Liberal Party who are saying, okay, oh no, we have to stop being as woke as we are because Pierre Polyev campaigned on anti-wokeness and look at the momentum he has. Maybe we better stop being so woke, which leads me to believe that they're just cynically woke. Yep. They don't actually believe any of the dumb stuff they say and their pronouns and their bio. They, they don't believe any of that. They really don't. They, it's an electoral strategy. If it were something that they fundamentally believed in, they wouldn't quickly recoil from it in horror once Pierre Polyev won on a platform of being anti-woke. You know, Sheila, here's why I think there is a possibility for a fall election uh, to answer uh, the uh, correspondence from I Am Black. And it's this. Trudeau might believe what his own government-funded media is saying. In the aftermath of the leadership convention, uh, the most oft-used word was the F word. No, not the four-letter F word, but the word fascist in uh, the coverage by the lefties of Pierre Polyev. And I'm thinking, he's talking about opening up the economy. He's talking about more affordable housing. And this is the bailiwick of a fascist. So yeah. my thinking, Sheila. Getting government out of your life. Like he literally said, oh, yeah. we got to get government. He campaigns on, let's get government out of your life. And the actual like crypto fascists in the liberal party, they're like, uh, that guy's the fascist. He's the yeah. fascist. So I'm they, thinking don't, if, they don't even know the definition. I know. Uh, no, no, they, it, it's like punch a Nazi. A, a Nazi is not somebody bent on... Uh, world conquest and engineering a genocide. It's somebody that has a disagreeable opinion to you and therefore, instead of a debate, use physical violence. It's that always, mindset. Yeah, and it, it's always said by people who have A, never punched somebody in their entire <laughs> life and B, never seen a Nazi in the wild. So that's my, my response, Sheila. If Justin Trudeau is gullible enough to believe what his own state-funded media is saying, and believing that Pierre Polyev is someone to vilify and demonize, that might make him pull the trigger. I think he's in for the proverbial October surprise. From your lips to God's ears. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I Am Black gives us five bucks. Again, thank you, thank you thank so you. much. And says, by the way, what's up with Menzi's red hair? <laughs> I want my donation back. He's always had red hair. I think it's all the sun. It's like a capillary action or something like that. Some science. I have to be very careful about my hair in the sun. I have this like big rat black muskrat pelt of hair on the top of my head. So I always have to make sure that I have like sunscreen or I'll get heat stroke. Like it, it, I have to cover it up. It'll bleach out. It's terrible. Is that a reference to what you said in the morning meeting, uh, Sheila, when you were uh, referring to us as the captain and Tennille? Because one of their big hits was muskrat love. Um, have you ever witnessed any muskrats out in your neck of the woods getting amorous? No. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> no. I did shoot one, though, that it was harassing my dog. I laid on my stomach and shot it under the <gasps> Um <laughs> Anyways. Uh, That's Lisa muskrat Proust- hate. <laughs> yeah, I do. I don't like them. <laughs> uh, Lisa Proust gives us 10 bucks, and Olivia whispers, we got to wrap it up. Uh, okay. Gives us 10 bucks. I met Alexa, and I love her. Uh, just like I do the whole bunch, uh, the whole team. P.S. Sheila, I love that you can talk so much in such a knowledgeable way regarding caribou, deep adm- admiration. Um, maybe I should talk a little less, though. I get that comment sometimes <laughs> on, on the live stream. Like, would, would Sheila shut up and let the other person talk? Um, I'm trying. And I think that's it. We're all cut up. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. A special thank you to all of those who made a financial donation. That's how we keep the lights on in here. And thank you to uh, Efren and Olivia and I believe Danny behind the boards. And, of course, my beloved co-host, Sheila Gunn-Reed. There will be two other rebels here at 12 noon Eastern tomorrow. And in the meantime, folks, as always, stay sane of any government is keeping Canadians safe and those are the decisions we took during the pandemic to ensure that Canadians stayed safe and 
you know, no government is ever going to get unanimous consent on every important measure it puts forward. But we put the safety of Canadians and the economic recovery that we're experiencing right now at the center of every decision we took during the pandemic. And if it is divisive to point out that vaccines have saved millions, billions of lives, the vaccines are safe, and the best way through this pandemic, which